And uh, many of us who are Hyde Parkers uh, are well familiar with Frank and also the Roby House and some of his other places. And so she's going to discuss that with us today. Trish is a Hyde Park blogger, historian, and storyteller. And she is fascinated by all the transformations here in Hyde Park. And she's actually known as Hyde Park Trish. She has her doctorate from U Chicago. And after teaching American studies and literature at Union College, St. Lawrence University and Michigan State University, she came back to Hyde Park. So we're glad she's here with us. And she's very active in various organizations here and around Hyde Park. So that's my introduction. But before we turn it over to her, uh, if you have any questions or comments that you want to make, save those to the end. You can uh, put them in the chat box and Pat and I will monitor the chat box. And or you can indicate uh, by using the, the knob that says raise your hand and uh, we'll get to those questions. Following that uh, discussion, we will have our usual uh, chat and connect, and uh, Laura Cracky is actually in or on her way to Boston uh, to visit with her great grandbaby, so she's not here today, so I will uh, host our uh, connect and chat after um, our discussion with Pat, uh, Trish, so Trish, it's all yours, take it away. Okay, let's see if I can get my screen back up. And see. If you aren't muted already, mute yourself, please. I think that makes the box small. So, um, so welcome. Uh, so I'm not sure it's not exactly the passions though I do talk about one of his big passions. Uh, but you know, this is uh, about Frank Lloyd Wright and Hyde Park. So Frank Lloyd Wright had this enormous career, of course, and you can break it into three acts. And so this is actually a story of act one, how he became Frank Lloyd Wright. And Hyde Park had a fairly large role in it, uh, which uh, kind of gets ignored uh, in the, uh, you know, the attention that comes from Oak Park. Oh. There we go. So uh, it's an origin story. So his origins are that his grandparents uh, emigrated from Wales. Uh, they were uh, the Joneses. They landed in Wisconsin where there were a lot of other Joneses. So they became very much known as the Lloyd Joneses to differentiate them. And as you can see, it's an enormous clan and it's very uh, much uh, a clan of people who support each other. Uh, mostly farmers. Their main motive for coming here was because they're Unitarians and you know, weren't uh, feeling comfortable about being Unitarians in England and, and Wales. And so they, they came to Wisconsin. They had a family motto called Truth Against the World, which of course is very much Frank's own motto. And Frank himself has very much got an allegiance to this as his clan. Uh, he uh, changed his name, his middle name actually was Lincoln, and he changed it to Lloyd. So he's Frank Lloyd Wright to be part of the clan. And this is, I've boxed out, here's his mother, Anna, and uh, Frank and his sister, Maginot. So his own family, his own parents were Anna and uh, William C. Wright. So as a young woman did when uh, at the time, uh, Anna was a teacher and teachers boarded with families uh, when they were single women. And so she's boarding with the Wrights. They have three kids and William's wife dies. So conveniently he marries Anna who's already living in the house to take care of his three kids. This turns out to be a little bit of a, a mistake uh, in that she is actually quite mean to the kids and they eventually the kids of his first family move in with their maternal grandmother. So William is, uh, Frank actually inherits quite a lot from William. Uh, he's incredibly charming. He is a very, very good speaker. 
He uh, loves music, also has, uh, teaches music at some point, and he absolutely has no idea how to handle money. So they end up traveling all over the place uh, as he finds jobs. He, people are charmed. They hire him and then very quickly fire him. So it, it, Anna is the one who has to keep the family afloat, you know, try to deal with things. And this is really hard for her because she really wants beautiful things. And she really wants Frank to be an architect. And it's pouring her energies into his education uh, at home. And finally, the brothers, the clan, the Lloyd Jones clan, shows up and says to William, OK, get lost. We'll take responsibility for Anna. We don't want to ever see you again. And Frank is 14. He never sees his father again. So one of the brothers is a really interesting character, Jenkin Lloyd Jones. And nobody seems to have written a real biography of him. I, I hope somebody does, because he was just a fascinating character. It's unlike the brothers uh, who were farmers, uh, Jenkin had, uh, as a teenager, had gone to the Civil War and fought in 11 brutal battles and uh, wounded. He always worked with, walked with a cane, but he came out of the war as a fervent pacifist. And he went to Meadville Seminary in Pennsylvania to become a Unitarian minister. He was extremely talented orator and they immediately recognized his uh, talents and sent him off to form Unitarian congregations across the Western United States. Uh, after a few decades of that, he decides to come to Chicago and work, uh, you know, work on the South Side. So he decides that he needs to build a, a church, uh, All Souls Church. He hires a very prominent architect named uh, Silsby. Uh, to build his church and word comes down from the clan that they want a chapel in spring green wisconsin for the clan so he takes silsby up to spring green to build this chapel which still exists and it gives you a sense of uh, silsby's shingle style architecture right frank as uh he's now 18 uh he did not graduate from college uh, from high school uh, he uh, goes to work for an engineer, uh, figures out how to get him in as a special student to the University of Wisconsin, where he manages to take four classes uh, in uh, geometry, mostly. He joins a fraternity. He spends a lot of money, gets into debt, uh, but, you know, he, he's itchy. And he hears that Uncle Jenk is showing up in Spring Green with a real architect. This is his dream. So he takes off from the University of Wisconsin uh, and shows up in Spring Green to meet Silsby in uh, May. Uh, there are people who say that he helped with the interior design. Um, there's no real documentation, I gather, but anyway, I showed the interior. This might be Frank's first work. So Frank decides this is his ticket and to the to the life of being an architect. So he basically steals uh, books from you know, that his father had left behind that were really valuable and sells them. He doesn't tell anybody what he's doing. He jumps on a train, comes to Chicago, gets a room in a boarding house, leaves behind a bunch of debts and just basically walks in on Silsby and says, hire me. And, you know, again, he's charming enough, like his dad, that he talks his way into this. And Silsby hires him, though he knows absolutely nothing. Uh, he, But there's a job for him, which is tracer. So he starts out simply tracing other people's designs onto, you know, other paper. So this is, I could not find a photo, a better photo, uh, of the All Souls Chapel. This was an illustration in the newspaper. Uh, and you can see why uh, Uncle Jenk turned to Silsby. He wanted this to be a, a house of God, a place where people came seven days a week to social events, to social support, to, uh, of course, you know, get, you know, improve themselves. And this is what uh, Silsby uh, builds for him on the corner of Oakwood and Langley, which is Hyde Park Township. So it counts as Hyde Park. So Wright is working for Silsby. He's not making much money, but he is making money. He's boarding with one of Silsby's uh, other draftsmen, who is a guy named Cecil Corwin. 
and he's hanging out at Uncle Jenks Church as his social life. And he literally bumps into a young girl uh, during a dance where everyone is dressed like characters from Les Miserables, which I really wish there were photos of, but oh well. Uh, so Kitty's only 15. They bu literally bump heads, apparently fall on the ground and uh, immediately love at first sight. Kitty's going to Hyde Park High School. Her parents are well off. They have a large house on uh, 47th and Kimbert. And uh, this is a step up for Frank uh, from the farming uh, immigrant Joneses. So he knows that if he's going to get anywhere with Kitty and her, her family, uh, he's going to have to um, be in better financial straits. So the first thing he does is he asks Silsby for a raise. Silsby says no. Uh, Frank sees there's a job open in a different architectural firm. So he ditches Silsby, goes there. He's in way over his head. He admits it, goes back to Silsby. Silsby then gives him the raise, which is the amazing thing about Wright is people are just willing to support him even when he's not that well behaved. Uh, and then he hears about a, yet another job at Adler and Sullivan, which is the cutting edge architectural firm in Chicago at the time. They're building adventurous buildings with the cutting edge of technology and uh, they're big contracts. But what they occasionally have is a uh, client who wants a house. And so they're kind of happy to have Wright show up. I mean, he knows how to build houses from working with Silsby less than a year, uh, but they hire him on as a draftsman. And Sullivan obviously really likes him because it's not very long that Wright goes to Sullivan and says, I need a raise. And Sullivan says, well, okay. And then Wright says, and I need a five-year exclusive contract or I need a five-year contract. And Sullivan says, okay, I'll give you a five-year contract, but it's gotta be exclusive. You have no moonlighting. And Wright says, okay. So he goes to the Tobins and he says, look, I'm making more money. I have a five-year contract on the most prestigious firm. And they say, okay, they let him, they say, you can marry Kitty. So they get married. She's 18, he's 21. He then turns around immediately and says to Sullivan, I need a $5,000 loan to build a house for Kitty. And Sullivan gives it to him. So Kitty's sisters are living in Oak Park. That's where she wants to go. Uh, Oak Park doesn't seem to be a good location for Frank, but it's... Um, a distance from Uncle Jenkin, which actually might have seemed attractive because I love this photo because you see Frank looks slightly trapped in his family. Uh, Anna moves down from Wisconsin with his two sisters and moves in next door. He builds the house and of course the house and studio for uh, the family. Uh, they eventually have six kids. That's Kitty with um, the first child, Frank Jr. There's Anna. And that's Uncle Jenk with his wife and daughter. So, you know, the, there's quite a family enclave and pretty soon the Tobins move into Oak Park. So yeah, he's surrounded. Oak Park though is great for Kitty. She fits right in. She hangs out with the uh, woman's uh, club. She uh, volunteers uh, like at Whole House uh, and she uh, makes all kinds of connections. So uh, the Kitty Oak Park uh, social circle becomes quite a source later on for uh, Frank's uh, clients. And of course, they have a, un a Unitarian church where he eventually builds the Unity Chapel out there. He doesn't fit in. His hair's too long. He dresses flamboyantly. He drives a really fancy sports car. He spends way too much money. So the next big event is uh, the Columbian Exposition, where every big architecture firm in New York and Chicago are in Chicago, in Hyde Park. So Frank gets to see what everybody is doing, what everybody's up to as he supports Louis Sullivan uh, as a draftsman. He's now in the office right next to Sullivan's. So everybody, uh, so the big New York firms are in the court of honor where everything is white, partly because they're saving time and money by spray painting everything. Uh, but it's classical, it's grandiose, it's um, a lot of ornamentation that's you know, it's vaguely Greco-Roman. Sullivan is not in the Court of Honor. This is Sullivan's uh, transportation building. It's also, as you might notice, not white. 
uh, he just breaks the rules. It's Byzantine uh, and it's colorful and it has a very Sullivan-esque doorway. Some people claim Wright contributed to the doorway, but it, it's a little unclear and that's it's a very Sullivan-esque looking thing. So he's not really getting to do his own work. Uh, the, art, the house situation kind of dries up in the firm. So he's not really getting to do his own work and he needs money. So while everybody else is busy working on building the buildings and designing the buildings in 1892, Wright starts uh, building a lot of these bootleg houses, illegal because, well, they they break his contract. You know, he's supposed to be not moonlighting. He claims there are three. He talks about three bootleg houses and they're here in Kenwood. Uh, People who have done research, though, are finding a lot more. So there are a lot more of these moonlit houses, but they're not ones that Wright claimed. I think because he gets to do things with these houses that uh, start him experimenting and, and you know start him on the way towards his own architecture. So when I got looking at the MacArthur house, I got thinking to myself, wait a minute, he's 24. He can't sign the paperwork. Oh, yeah. So I skipped ahead. The reason I have these guys here, this is Cecil. So Frank can't sign the paperwork. paperwork. So his good old friend Cecil from Silsby's days uh, is signing the paperwork for him. So he can't sign the paperwork. Who are these people with a lot of money who are building big houses who are hiring this young guy who, you know, where there's something kind of shady? Well, it turns out that MacArthur and Blossom are members of the All Souls Church. They have known Wright for years. They're friends with Uncle Jenkin. And, uh, you know, they're, they're totally on board with helping out uh, Uncle Jenkin's nephew. MacArthur has made his fortune, um, or, you know, they're, they're upper middle class. They're not the super wealthy. Uh, but he's selling these kinds of lanterns across the entire Western United States. And people have said, oh, these are colonial revival houses. He's hiding from Sullivan. Well, when you look at the third house, that, I don't think that's the explanation. Uh, I think maybe the clients maybe wanted this and maybe Frank was kind of experimenting with these different styles of, um, arch of you know, exterior look. But he's already experimenting with things that he's interested in, which is, he has this idea of domestic architecture is private. And so the side, it, they don't have big front doors. They have side doors where you wend your way in. Uh, they have porches, but they aren't welcoming people on. There are places where you can look out, but you can't be seen. And he's starting to explore how to blow up the box. He complains that houses are, the rooms are boxes inside boxes. And, you know, he, how do you not do that? So he's blowing out the corners. So the corners have these, uh, front and back have these, uh, this lovely uh, bow window of, of um, you know, of uh, leaded glass. And he's experimenting with cantilevering. So the, the corners are cantilevered out over the, over the windows. They're not load bearing. So the reason they're side by side is MacArthur had bought two lots and he convinces his friend George Blossom to, to do the lot next to him. He also knows Wright. He uh, could not find a photo of him. Uh, the only thing I could find is this um, uh, drawing from the newspaper of him fishing up in Minnesota. Uh, so there he is with his dog. So this is kind of interesting too, because it's uh, very classical, very elegant. It's probably a design he's experimenting with uh, that was done by McKim Mead and White, who are the hot, uh, fancy architects, you know, here present for the fair. It's a colonial revival. It's very, um, very formal. And you can see that the, the floor plan uh, looks like it's, again, four, four boxes, uh, sort of opening uh, in the middle in these four boxes. But when you go into the building, it actually doesn't have doors. There, what it has is these archways. And so he's opening up the floor plans already into a different kind of space where you can flow through it, you can see different things. Uh, and it's a really lovely place. Oh, I included this photo from the 50s because most of the time I've been around, 
the house has been yellow. And I was kind of shocked to see the other day that the new private owners have turned it gray. But gray may actually have been the color it was supposed to be because this is the color it is in the 50s. Inside, they're, they're lovely, not amazingly unusual, but they are lovely uh, examples of arts and crafts interiors with built-ins and beautiful glass and this, you know the, the beauty of the wood. And they start to have this glass. So I think it's 79 of his houses, the buildings all have um, this leaded glass. And each of the buildings, the design is completely different. Uh, so he designs the glass particularly to carry the message of that particular building. Um, it gives, it means you don't have to have curtains. It means you, you know, can have this uh, lovely uh, light coming into the, the buildings and you can carry a theme throughout. Uh, so the Blossom House has this very formal uh, sort of festoons, uh, you know, for the very formal, elegant uh, house. And the MacArthur House has that swirly pattern and it shows up everywhere, first floor, third floor. So this is what I mean by, I'm not sure he was hiding because this is the third of the bootleg houses. In 1951, there's a retrospective of his career and he starts the retrospective with this house. This is the house where he gets to be Frank Lloyd Wright for the first time. Harlan is a dentist and a bank executive um doesn't seem to be a unitarian not quite sure how they how they hooked up but he apparently was totally willing to let uh frank have a make a very different looking house and it's got the some of the same ideas though the side entrance the way the balcony and the uh, patio um are private spaces uh bands of casement windows and this wonderful ornamentation very Sullivan-esque ornamentation that's all over the outside. It's an oak leaf pattern. When I say he wasn't hiding, he really wasn't hiding. This is at 44th and Greenwood. Louis Sullivan's living at 45th and Lake Park. So he sees this house. And there are at least three different versions of what happens next, all of them narrated by Wright and you know, all of them slightly questionable, but it ruptures the relationship. Frank is moonlighting and, you know, taking Sullivan-esque ideas and not telling anybody. And Louis Sullivan, you know, is not happy. However, you know, so they see this as, you know, so, you know, they fire him. That's not entirely clear because one thing that's happening is there's this huge national depression Adler and Sullivan's business is drying up. And by 1894, the firm is dissolved. So, you know, they, Frank may have been on the way out simply because the whole firm was in trouble. Weirdly, this offered an opportunity to do something really, really different that he chooses not to do. And it must have been kind of hard decision to make because Daniel Burnham, who's uh, you know, the giant who makes the fair happen. Uh, he comes out of the fair with as the, the premier architecture firm uh, going on in, in Chicago. And he offers Frank uh, this opportunity. So everybody, including Louis Sullivan, had gone to study and got technical training as well as aesthetic training at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris. And Daniel Burnham offers to send Frank to four years at the École de Beaux-Arts, all expenses paid. And then two years at Burnham's Rome Atelier as sort of a postdoc, all expenses paid. And then a guaranteed job with the Burnham firm when he is done with his education. And it, it's not that, you know, Frank likes him. He calls him Uncle Dan. But he turns him down. And I think that's really interesting uh, to be to have that strength of mind uh, to turn down a guaranteed big deal career like that. Um, it might have been Kitty didn't want to go to Paris, but he had done the Harlan House, which he sees as his own. And I think he just really wanted to do what he wanted to do at this point. And, and he's ready to do it. So he sets out on his own. Um, 
this is, uh, you know, it, when you say on his own at, at this point in his career, yes, it's his own firm, but he's deeply embedded with all of these other guys who are also starting out. Uh, he's uh, got, he shares office space with Cecil Corwin uh, and this guy, Dwight Perkins. Dwight Perkins' mother had worked with Uncle Jenkins. So uh, as this as a secretary like thing. And uh, so Dwight had known Uncle Jenk for a really long time. Uh, he shares office space with, with Wright and he had gone to MIT. Dwight has a cousin, Marion Mahoney, who was one of the first women to get an architecture degree from MIT. One of, if not the first woman to get a Illinois uh, license to practice architecture. It's the 1890s and to give Frank credit, he hires a woman, he hires Marion. And the other thing to give him credit is Marion is very strong-minded and is famous because she's the one who tells him when she thinks his design is bad. She's the one that uh, <laughs> teases him and laughs at him. And, uh, but she also completely buys into his aesthetic. She's the one that's uh, there's these beautiful presentation uh, watercolors of the works in this period, and they're done primarily by Marion Mahoney. And she becomes very close to the family and really good friends with Kitty. This is Marion on the left and Kitty on the right. Frank also hangs out with everybody who's making a career out of the arts. So he becomes a founding member of the Cliff Dwellers where you got Laredo Taft, Hamlin Garland, Clarence Darrow, you know, the guys uh, hanging out in the club uh, on Michigan Avenue. Most of them are Hyde Parkers. So I, I keep coming back to, I, I think he would have had a slightly different um, arc if he had stayed in Hyde Park, but that's value bias. So one of the things, uh, the arts and crafts guys are looking at is Japanese art. And one of the wonderful things about the fair was uh, they'd been reading about it, but they got to actually experience it at the fair and what these spaces were like with these extended eaves and the open floor plans and uh, also uh, what prints, you know, what the what the prints were like. And uh, you could do a whole other talk about uh, Frank Lloyd Wright and uh, the influence of Japanese art and architecture. Uh, but it's important. Coming out of the fair, there's a there's a movement uh, that's called City Beautiful, uh, where it, it, people are saying, oh, look what they pulled off for the fair. We can make cities be like this. So they're clean and they're beautiful and they're spaces that enhance people's lives. How do we do that? And it related to it was the House Beautiful movement, where you think that architecture itself can do this. Um, so the, a Unitarian minister named Gannett had, gave a sermon called The House Beautiful. Uh, and uh, uh, his friend, uh, Wright's friend, William Wilson Winslow, and uh, he had heard this and they decided that it needed to be printed up, that they would spread uh, sort of uh, his message of uh, that architecture could enhance spiritual, intellectual, societal, and physical health. Uh, it, Wright is very immersed in the theory of what he's doing. He gives talks, including a really famous one about arts and crafts and the machine. Um, the arts and crafts movement that's coming out of England is very much about hand doing everything. And, and Wright is saying, no, no, we can use technology to create organic beauty. So this is the, the book that they publish. This is Wright's art in, in the book. And you can see he's still very influenced by, by Sullivan. Uh, he likes the machine-like repetition that's going on. And in the back pages he, on beautiful handmade uh, Japanese paper, he does these photogravures of weeds, <laughs> which, uh, I will come back later because I have a theory about Roby House. So he has these tall, thin prairie grass weeds. He's mostly working through this network of clients that he's got going out in Oak Park through Kitty's Connections, through the Unitarian Church. Uh, but he, he comes back to Hyde Park to do Heller House, which is a real leap. And the reaction to it, uh, 
by critics is that it's outrageous. Uh, it's a leap too far. Um, so when you walk down Woodlawn and you pass it, one of the reactions I had to it was, well, can it be Frank Lloyd Wright? It's very vertical. Well, when it was built, it didn't have a neighbor and it, um, uh, Wright is thinking of it as a horizontal house down this long, narrow city lot. And so this is the presentation drawing of it as a horizontal house. Um, and it's, he's one of the ideas he got from Louis Sullivan was how you form follows function that uh, you look at a building and you can see the different activities that are inside. So um, this is, you know, there's the, the open public spaces, then there's the more private bedroom spaces differentiated on the uh, upper floor and then the space up above where the children play and the servants live. It's got the, you know, the balconies that are private, the side door uh, bands of casement windows, this horizontal line. And this Sullivan-esque decoration on the frieze, this is done by his buddy, Richard Bach. Uh, unfortunately, they seem to have used staff, uh, which is the temporary material the fair was made out of. They didn't use terracotta. And so here, somebody tried to sandblast it in the 70s and has gotten very damaged and it's uh, been restored. So that was, um, yeah, I guess they did it a little bit on the cheap. And this is Isidore Heller. He, um, his wife was from Wisconsin. That might've been how he hooked up with Wright or he, he may have just have wanted a, an outrageous house. Uh, Wright is very much now designing the inside and it's the floor plan is opening up uh, he's still celebrating the beauty of natural wood, and he's using this uh, sand textured plaster with saturated colors uh, for the for the walls. And he's doing and he's really blowing out the the walls of light. So this is the stairwell. And Heller, as he lived there, realized that it's a long, narrow city lot. Somebody could build right next to him. And so he buys a hunk of the lot to the north so that he can protect the light coming into his, his wall. And Wright is now dictating the furniture when he can. So the original chairs were what they call cube chairs, these cubes of wood with a nice soft cushion in the middle. And he's making them by uh, decorative objects that he thinks belong in his houses. So one of the things he's giving to a lot of his clients is a thing he's calling a long, thin, you know, Art Nouveau kind of vase uh, that's uh, he calls a weed keeper. So we're continuing this weed theme. And he also gives everybody or makes them buy a um, winged victory of Samothrace. I don't know why. <laughs> I'm, that's one of my mysteries that I'm going to pursue. So he doesn't always have clients that are happy with him. And one of them was Uncle Jenkin. Uncle Jenkins hires him to build the Abraham Lincoln Center, which is his settlement house. And as you can see, this is a project that drags on for years. Um, Wright tries a design that is very Sullivan-esque with the, um, down on the main floor was going to be this auditorium for people who flocked to Uncle Jenkins lectures. Uh, floors in between that were going to be uh, places where, you know, literacy projects and uh, childcare and, you know, all kinds of things that were helping this, you know, the immigrant and impoverished uh, neighborhoods around it. And of course, the cornice punctuating the top. Wright was using all kinds of lovely woods, nice materials as he liked to use. And Uncle Jenkins looked at it and said, oh, no, it was way too expensive. This is not at all what I want. Uh, so he brings in Dwight Perkins. Of course, he's known since a child. And uh, he and Wright wrestle with it, come up with a second plan. Jenkins it, turns it down. And Wright writes on it, built over the objections of the architect, uh, and storms off. So he's on the outs with Uncle Jenkins at this point, mid-1905. And Dwight Perkins finishes it. It still stands. It's on uh, Oakley, Oakwood and Langley. Unfortunately, the All Souls Chapel is gone. Every once in a while, uh, 
right would get the ideal client. And the ideal client comes along in 1909, and it's the Robies. They want a Frank Lloyd Wright house. Uh, Laura Roby is a graduate of the University of Chicago. She wants to live close to campus. She's involved in campus activities. Uh, she's from Springfield. She knows the Danas. She knows you know, what Wright did for the Dana house. She wants a Frank Lloyd Wright house. Frederick is an engineer, very much into streamlining. This is his invention, the Roby cycle car. He shared a love of cars with, with Wright. And yeah, he's all on board. And they get a Frank Lloyd Wright house. So it's shockingly modern. When I first was here, I didn't know anything about it and uh, walked down Woodlawn and I thought it was a modern house. I had no idea it was built in 1910, 1910, 1909 was started, 1910 finished. Uh, it takes his ideas that he's been working on all this time and leaps into modernism, you know, or the geometric shapes um, all kinds of ideas, but it's the, you know, it's the balconies and patios where you see but can't be seen. It's the bands of uh, glass windows uh, creating this horizontal line, but also opening up the walls. Uh, of course, it's very much not about boxes within boxes uh, when we look inside. One of the things I find interesting about it is a massive amount of brick. I mean, it's a big house. Uh, is it seems to float. Uh, of course, it uses uh, these big I-beams that are cantilevered off that massive chimney. So you've got a 10-foot unsupported span floating over the, the front, and it comes to a prow. Oops. <laughs> so here's what it looks like now with the restoration. You can see it's wide open, but it flows from dining room to, to living room. It's, uh, it plays a lot with the light. The walls have disappeared. And this is my theory about weeds. I think these are prairie plants. Uh, stems, little leaves, and then the bushy flower heads. Anyway, it, he seems to have this thing for the weeds. So that's my theory. And the light fixtures do, uh, this is the original one. The replicas don't do it, but the this original one throws this the same pattern as the stained glass up up on the walls. So, I mean, it really is a, a stunning building. But he doesn't see it completed. He runs off with Mima. So Mima, if I had done this talk last year, I would be on, yeah, she's the other woman and she broke up his marriage and this is all bad. In 2023, uh, this, the very first biography of her came out written by a distant relative. And she turns out to be this really interesting figure. And the story about how they are going to Europe is really different. They both have projects in Europe. And Wright is, I think, burned out. One thing, he's done like 137 buildings in like five years. Uh, he's got 30 projects going on at the same time as Roby House. You know, he needs the money, of course. Um, he hates Hope Park. Um, so partly he's read that up and Maimon never fit into Oak Park and she falls in love and they're ready to go. His project is the Wasmuth portfolio, which is these stunning, beautiful presentations of his work to this point. And he knows this is going to solidify his reputation and be an ability to articulate his vision of her architecture. She is uh, wants to is in the process of setting up the ability to translate uh, from Swedish to English, the works of this woman, Ellen Kej, who's a radical Swedish feminist. So she's got this project in Sweden. He's got this project in Germany. So they go to Europe, check into a hotel, um, uh, sign in as Frank Lloyd Wright and Mrs. Frank Lloyd Wright. And someone tips off a journalist. The journalist comes you know, verifies that, you know, they've checked in and it hits the Chicago newspapers as this scandal. Everything blows up. Uh, they're hounded from hotel to hotel. They do complete their projects, but, you know, it's it's rather a nightmare. And it ruptures all of these relationships that, that Wright had with all of these colleagues and the guys, he gets voted out of the Cliff Dwellers Club. And, you know, it's, it's, it's chaotic mess. 
So they retreat to the clan, to Spring Green, where the Lloyd Joneses are, and he builds Taliesin. And I think this is a phase where he's actually quite joyful, uh, where, where, yes, things are horribly tense and they're, they're different. Uh, but the reason I think that is I got really looking at Midway Gardens, which was a really big project for him in this period. Uh, he's, as, as usual, he's hired to do a small thing. He's hired to do a, a German beer garden with music. And he persuades the owner, Waller, to turn it into this extravaganza. And he has this vision of it being the unification of the arts. It's his crazy architecture. Uh, it's Richard Box murals. It's Ian Ellie statues. It's the symphonic music, Wagner in particular. And uh, it, uh, Anna Pavlova comes with her troupe. So it's the performing arts. And this is all going to come together in this joyful experience at 60th and Cottage Grove. So in the summer, you'd be outside. In the winter, you're in the winter garden and there's a restaurant, there's two swimming pools, there's a dance floor. This is the cigar stand and Richard Bach's murals are all these bubbles or effervescent uh, champagne bubbles. The sprites that are inside are these joyful things. So this is, I think, you know, the. You know that this is a moment with Mema that you know, and you know he feels like he's really got his creative juices going. And then he gets a telegram while they're working on it that he has to rush back to Wisconsin. And there's this horrible, horrible thing, which is this uh, handyman um, who they know is acting very strangely. So they tell him, you know, that he has to go. He uh, sets fire to the to Taliesin. He locks all the doors and windows except one. He stands at the one with an ax. And so people are uh, caught between the flames and the smoke and the ax and seven people die. Mema, her two kids and four assistants. And Taliesin is burnt. And this totally ends anything you can look at is this first phase of his career. He's, I said his years in the wilderness. Uh, you know, he makes really bad choices. He doesn't get contracts. He's doing so little work that everybody thinks he's old fashioned by the time you get to the thirties and you've got the 20th century uh, styles. Uh, and then he meets Old Gavana. Old Gavana is 30 years his junior. And she is the one that turns things around and makes an act three because she's experienced this herself. She studied with a guru, um, a maestro and paid money to be the apprentice and learn at the maestro's feet. She sets that up for Frank. Uh, so you have the Taliesin system, you have apprentices who come internationally because the thing the Wasmuth portfolio did was build his international reputation. And so he has apprentices who are causing, you know, creating their finances. And bit by bit, he starts getting even little um, jobs and he, blows each one of them just out of the ballpark. So the parents of one of the apprentices say, we, we bought this little piece of land in Western Pennsylvania and we want our getaway cottage. Uh, so Frank designed us a getaway cottage. And of course, what he does is fall in water. Uh, Johnson says to them, you know, we, we need an office. Uh, can you build us an office? And he builds, you know, the, the Johnson uh, extravaganza of concrete mushrooms. Uh, they're very modern looking. They're very, you know, much a uh, leap into what's going on in the mid 20th century. So uh, he's always had the ability to generate attention. He writes his autobiography. He's uh, become the kind of person that, you know, Mike Wallace interviews. And so he can pull attention to a project. And when Roby House is threatened in the 1950s with demolition, that's what he does. He is in Chicago, he gathers in the attention of all of the reporters that he can. He gathers in his fraternity brothers, they're Phi Delta Theta. So what you can't tell in this picture that's on the left is there's a huge crowd out in where the photo is being taken. Uh, and he's lauds, you know, he calls it the cornerstone of modern architecture and why it should be saved. The problem is why it's in danger is that Chicago Theological Seminary needs a dorm. They own this property right across from their facility. 
and they don't want to go any further away. And but the fraternities to the north, you know, are stuck there, are in the way, and they don't want to be the bad guys. But right now they're the bad guys. And what saves it is actually urban renewal. Uh, the the guy who's in charge of tearing down and rebuilding a big hunk of Hyde Park is a guy named Zeckendorf. And he says, oh, well, you need offices. So he bought Roby House to use as his offices, which gave money to the Chicago Theological Seminary. At the same time, uh, what's happening is nobody at this time has any idea of landmarking buildings or preservation just because you like the buildings and they have value. And it this starts the wheels going. So Len Dupre is the alderman. He is in city council. And they start the wheels going to create a form of city, city landmarking, which had not existed before this Roby House discussion. Um, so CTS has the money. The Phi Delta Thetas step in, negotiate with the fraternities that are to the north and allow um, CTS to buy those buildings and build the dorm just to the north of Roby House. When Zeckendorf's done, he donates it to the university. The university still owns it. Um, used it in various ways. And then in the 1990s, uh, decided it really needed some restoration work. And so they still own it. They've leased it to the home and studio. So the board of the home and studio, at least at that time, I'm not sure, you know, it's quite a few years later, uh, but in the late 90s, it was still the children of Kitty and Frank. And so it kind of came full circle that uh, they took over a Roby house and brought it back to life. So thank you. Sorry, I went a kind of a long time, but uh, there's an awful lot to, to say to this. Uh, that's the end and I can take questions as soon as I figure out how to oh, stop sharing. There we go. Does someone have a question? Uh, unmute yourself or put it in the chat box. Trish, this is Cheryl. Um, how did you find the, the last photo, the one with the clear land beside um, Roby House? Um, actually, I've had it for a little while, so I don't actually quite remember. Uh, some of them were in the newspaper. Some of them were mm -hmm. screen grabs out of the newspaper. Um, hmm. I think that one is probably in the Chicago Historical mm. Society digital collections because uh, mm -hmm. they have all of the daily news um, photos. Wow, wow. I like it because um, looking north, I've always thought that that building beside the Roby was kind of in the way, kind of, you know, detracts you know it'd be nice to have it gone for a little bit <laughs> <laughs> well yeah i mean the thing is that's what they were going to build you know so you would have that instead of roby house you know yeah you know. So. yeah i mean it was a whole community effort to i mean i didn't go into all the gory details but uh you know linda prey had to get it rezoned and i mean everybody is you know trying to pitch in to, to save yeah. it at a time when they aren't saving anything else yeah, incredible, huh? Yeah, it's now um, it's now protected in every possible way. It's it's um, National Historic Landmark is the first building with architectural value and not historical value that got landmark. It's a city landmark, which is the one that with with real teeth that protects things. It's an Illinois landmark, which protects the inside and the outside, and it's a, uh, a UNESCO world mm -hmm. historic uh, heritage site, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Gila, do you want to ask your question? Sure, yeah, I was just interested if you've been to um, any of these places in person and seen them, because I mean, the pictures are gorgeous. It's really cool. Yeah, so well, one reason I got thinking about these early years is there was a struggle, a fight to try to save the bootleg houses for uh, a project that um, uh, the Pritzkers had to turn them in, to restore them and have them be public, uh, have them be um, very high-end B&Bs. 
So I got the pictures of the interiors. I have a lot, I have hundreds of pictures I took of the interiors of the Blossom and MacArthur House. Uh, Roby House, I was a docent for, I guess, five years. In oh, the wow. Way. Yeah, so the um, when the home and studio took it over, uh, they really didn't, you know, they were taking off uh, really on the fly. Uh, so they basically just told us all that were volunteering that we could uh, write our own tours. <laughs> so that was fun. Um, now it's very regimented. Uh, you know, and you hmm. really don't talk about MAMA. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, I really, I really, so I got to see it as it went through. It was really in bad shape. And then it kept getting better and better, you know, and as they kept restoring parts of it. So yeah, so I've uh, pictures, the pictures of the inside Roby house, you yeah. know. Heller, Heller is down the street. I've never been inside those pictures, those interiors were, it was on the market uh, a little while ago. So I, I grabbed those when it was on the market. Oh, nice. Kathy, do you want to make your comment? I just wanted to thank Trish for going longer. It's wonderful to hear your retrospective. Oh. I, in fact, have been in the Heller house. Friends of mine owned it. And it was a nightmare <laughs> trying to get uh, things done. Uh, they weren't there very long. I think they kind of considered that maybe they didn't want to continue with trying to restore it. But oh, um, it's yeah. it's lovely inside. Yeah, I, I I mean, well, that's the thing. With, I mean, Roby House, it's spectacular. But you know, as I said, I got to watch the the real hard start of the restoration and yeah it was rough you know partly because everything is unique right um, i've also been in a unisonian house has anyone else the one that's down in west lafayette uh there was a tour there many many years ago we actually missed the tour because we forgot about the time change because when you as you travel west there is an hour there that you miss but they very kindly allowed us to see the uh, house after we arrived. And uh, those Unisonian houses, there was one behind the Museum of Science and Industry, if anyone remembers that. I just think they were wonderful. I mean, they seemed to be a way we could solve some of the housing issues with housing shortages for uh, folks that you know can't afford a lot of property and don't want a lot of space. Yeah, he, I mean, Wright is, you know, a difficult kind of guy, but he's also, you know, he really was, he wanted, he wanted architecture to change people's lives. And yeah, he really wanted to create with the Usonians a, a, an affordable and interesting way for people to have interesting houses. Um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, they famously leak. <laughs> I once had a huge laugh uh, when I was giving tours. I, 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 there, there were literally as I gave tours, there were buckets catching rain oh, right. inside the inside the dining. Room. You know, a lot of uh, rights properties leaked, right? <laughs> <laughs> so Richard has two questions. You want to ask your questions, Richard? Did he type them in chat or something? Yes, I'll read them. The first one is, Frank seems to have had a long, lifelong association with Unitarian spiritualists. Can you talk a bit more about that? Was he actually religious and observant? Um, well, Chris, observant and Unitarian, I mean, as you know, he's... Um, he, he, I don't think he, uh, I think once, you know, things blew up on him, he didn't attend a congregation. Um, but he, uh, at least I, I haven't, uh, uh, noticed it, but as I say, I'm not, I'm not a, a complete right expert in all of, you know, the later parts of his life. Um, but he very much echoes the spiritual values, particularly articulated by uncle Jenkin. Um, and uh, that he's doing all the way up into the his 90s. I mean, he's doing these big interviews, you know, 
so yeah he maintained he maintained an emotional connection to it even if he didn't uh, form you know part of a congregation gary has a comment uh as a unitarian you can't be observant and unitarian at the same time <laughs> thank you for sharing well, I say, yeah I, I was you know <laughs> I am not Unitarian, so I, I didn't want to say that, but that was my feeling is, you know, it's not, you know, um, but he very much, I mean, Uncle, I wish somebody would do a biography of Uncle Jenkins because, you know, he was working with Booker T. Washington and Susan B. Anthony and, you know, and um, Hull House and, you know, he had all of these, uh, you know, ideas that were nationally influential. He organized the Congress of Religions, which is a big deal during the, you know, Columbian Exposition. It's really quite a, quite a figure. Um, but, you know, there doesn't seem to be, there's short biographies, but there isn't a thorough, you know, look at his life. They clearly influenced uh, Frank you know, for his whole life. Richard has another question. Can you talk a bit about the subsequent owners of the Hyde Park residence? Yeah, I can't. Um, I, I have not done a detailed thing of all of them. Uh, the lucky thing with MacArthur and... Um, uh, uh, the Blossom House is they got bought um, <clears throat> early on in like I think the late 40s even by by owners that kept it for an extremely long time. So the interiors were extremely well well preserved and they were artists and uh, and it, uh, and I talked to they uh, the children of them were the ones selling the house when you know I got to go in. And one of them was saying that she, in later life, actually got to meet Wright and mentioned to him how much she likes, uh, she lived in the MacArthur house and how much they really liked the, the dining room. And he immediately remembered everything about it. Uh, so these were houses that were important to him. Uh, and I'm, I hope the interiors have been preserved. It's, you know, they're privates and I don't know. Um, Keller House went through quite a quite a few owners, and of course the Roby House, uh, it's miserable to live in. It's extremely cold, and with the, those great walls of single pane glass. Uh, so you know the Robies, the Robies got divorced very fast. It's one reason I make their picture. They're separated. Uh, the Wilbers lived there a little while. Um, they you know the CTS buys it pretty early on, uh, so that didn't get lived in very much. Um, and then the Harlan house, he, he got in legal trouble. Uh, he left, uh, had owners for a short term and it was used for various purposes, but 44th and Greenwood, uh, deteriorated pretty fast. And then it was in a bad, bad shape. And then in 1963, it burns. Uh, so they didn't have exactly happy stories. Heller had the best run in terms of owners. Any other, uh, question you might want to raise. Richard says, thanks, thanks so much, Trish. <laughs> so we do want to say thank you for being with us today uh, and sharing your experiences and knowledge with us. Many of us Hyde Parkers remember Trish doing a tour of the Nichols Park. And she also previously did a Zoom on the uh, Japanese garden uh, behind uh, MSI. So this is three times as a charm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Trish. Well, it's fun to share the research, you know. It's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, you know, we, we live in a really amazing neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do. Yes. Yeah. So, Anne, do you want to uh, move us on to the next phase? Well, I think it's just to thank Trish very, very much. And I hope we can find another topic for you to do, because I think we all learn a lot. Mm -hmm. And it <laughs> makes us appreciate our community. So if you have um, <clears throat> more topics, let us know. Oh, I got, I got a lot of them. And okay. I, I will I will make a pitch uh, this week. Uh, the Herald will publish uh, my piece on the Golden Lady. Oh, really? Oh, oh. that's wonderful. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, we need we have a very rich in history community and we need to know more of it. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. Did Wright ever get an architectural certification degree? Any? Nothing. He never did. Well, Even though he... so this is this is the thing. Um, it probably so he pushes the technology to its absolute limits, perhaps in part because he has a limited understanding of some of the chemistry and stuff involved. And most of the time it kind of works. Uh, but, you know, that's one reason he has leaky houses and stuff. So uh, <laughs> <Okay>. that's <laughs> I what think, I would uh, like. I think a problem with the Unity Temple, if I recall correctly, is it doesn't have correct expansion joints. And mm. so the, the concrete doesn't expand correctly. Uh, on the other hand, he did the Johnson wax thing with those giant concrete pillars which nobody thought would work and it's standing still so yeah. yeah but i think it part of part of his willingness to do wild and adventurous technological experiments was he didn't know they weren't possible <laughs> <laughs> very good but oh we thank you so much and we look forward to reading your article and um, maybe we'll get you again to do something for us so okay <laughs> yeah um I'm so glad everyone came. It's delightful. Join us for our holiday celebrations that are coming, and uh, we hope to see more of you.